the uh, new academic stuff, we thought we'd just uh, invite Mike here to kind of go over some of the highlights of this and that. And, and as far as Danvers goes, you know, I've been working with a lot of parents, you know, that they come to me and we talk about things. And uh, I, I guess there's always going to be questions. I mean, <laughs> especially this thing here. It, it's not really a law, it's, it's a guideline. And so you don't have to, they, we don't have to implement this. But, but what's going to happen? I don't know. I, I, when, I, when I hear about and try to read this bill, I think of things like Nancy Pelosi would say, uh, well, we got to pass the bill to see what's in the bill. Now we passed it. Right? And so when you look at it, it's 50, 54 pages. There's over 10 hyperlinks in there. Then when you start going through the hyperlinks, you know, there's another 1,500 pages, and it hyperlinks to more stuff, and it's like, yeah, it's a maze. That's why we have people that go through all this stuff and, 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 and summarize it and boil it down to what's going on. And every town, they can ignore this. They don't have to implement it. They can implement some of it. They can implement all of it. So we don't know what Danvers is going to do. They're probably still trying to go through the bill. <laughs> and, and, and I, I keep hearing that. I, I didn't notice whether it's written in the law how if you implement this, you get money. If you don't, you don't get money. Or you get more if you do this, less if you do that. I don't know. But hopefully that will all come up in the discussion. But uh, again, I, I, you know, you know, as you know, I sent out a postcard a while back from the Danish Republican Committee. I sent it to a bunch of people in town, and I kind of talked about the woke agenda, and we posted it on Facebook, and people commented on it, saying none of this academic stuff, all this, is not woke. It's, this is just Danders being Danders, but. That's why I'm going to pull you a Prague U University uh, video. It's a five minute video that kind of goes over how this all starts and where, it, you know, where, where is this going to end. We don't know. But, uh, so, you know, let's just, uh, we'll start with this five minute video to, to the introduction. And, and this is basically, again, just kind of goes over the history of, the, uh, of, of all this. Uh, you know, gender studies and updates and things. At what age is it appropriate for grammar school teachers to discuss issues like sex and gender with their students? Should it be done with kids as young as pre-K, second grade, fifth? Even a decade ago, the most common answer would have been never. These are simply not appropriate subjects for young children. If for some reason they did have to be raised, it would be the parent's job, not the teacher's. Today, it's much different. Now these are pressing questions and very much on the minds of parents. They're part of what the media calls the culture war. But parents didn't start this war. The war has been waged on us. Until recently, we had no idea it was even happening. Now it's hand-to-hand -hand combat, school boards versus mom and dad. It's not clear who's winning. Starting in September 2022, New Jersey first graders will learn about gender identity under new sex education guidelines. A sample lesson plan reads as follows. You might feel like you're a boy, even if you have body parts as some people might tell you are girl parts. You might feel like you're a girl, even if you have body parts as some people might tell you are boy parts. And you might not feel like you're a boy or a girl, but you're a little bit of both. No matter how you feel, you're perfectly normal. Yes, Junior might be struggling with his fractions, but never fear, he's rock solid on his preferred pronouns. <laughs> the Evanston Skokie School District 65 in Illinois has adopted a new LGBTQ plus equity week curriculum that will teach kids in pre-K and kindergarten about people who have more than one gender or no gender at all. Kids in first grade can pick their own pronouns, including Z, Zer, and Tree, and are told they can switch pronouns anytime they wish. All feelings are respected all the time. Third graders, generally around eight years old, are also encouraged to overcome their prejudice that gender is binary. Parents have mounted a counterattack. Our deep concern that our children are being prematurely sexualized and thus confused about their identity is manifest in Florida's Parental Rights and Education Act. Its text plainly states that discussion of sexual orientation is out of bounds. This piece of legislation, which now has counterparts in several other states, has 
has in turn been mocked by progressives. Setting aside the appropriateness of teaching small children that their gender is valuable or that kids designating tree as their preferred pronoun is okay, progressives say that Florida law is unnecessary. Why? Because these progressives claim these lessons aren't actually taught. They are a figment of the parent's imagination. Some figment. But if this is all just a fever dream on the right, then opponents of these bills are caught in their own circular logic. If these topics aren't taught in schools, then why is the bill controversial? Florida would be legislating against nothing. But that's not what's happening. Recently, in the Glendale Unified School District in California, parents confronted their school board after they learned that a third grade teacher had shown their kids videos for Gay Pride Month that included nudity and discussions of sexual arousal. A decade ago, this teacher would have been chased out of town with pitchforks, metaphorically speaking. Today, it's controversial. The purpose of the Florida law is to stop this sort of education. Activists and their media allies say the Florida bill stigmatizes kids who are not heterosexual or who have gay parents. Never mind that being straight is also a sexual orientation. The point is, any classroom discussion about sex and gender identity should be off the table. It's not surprising parents want to protect their small children from inappropriate lessons that have nothing to do with what school is supposed to be about. You know, quaint notions like reading, writing, and arithmetic. What's surprising is that it's even an issue at all. Why is this madness, and what is it if not madness, even happening? And who's behind it? It's not like there was a crying demand from seven-year-old boys to identify themselves as a girl or as a boy and a girl. These questions are not easy to answer. The sudden eruption of madness is never easily explained. But this much is not in doubt. You're not crazy. They're crazy. You're not crazy to be worried about what your children are learning in school. They're crazy for wanting your children to ponder their sexual identity in second grade. You didn't start this culture where they did. But we have to win it, or we will all suffer the consequences. I say we because I'm one of you. I moved from New York, where I had lived my entire life, to Florida to protect my children. The progressive left is using sexual identity issues as a bulldozer. They've run over the educational establishment, and they're coming for your house. Parents, men, barricades. I'm Carol Markowitz, columnist for the New York Post for Prager University. Thank you for watching this video. To keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax deductible donation. So, so just to bring it back to damage, like I said, I talked about the woke agenda. I got kind of mocked and ridiculed, but that's okay. That's part of the turf we deal with. But as you can see, I mean, she had to move from New York to Florida to, to, to escape. All these issues are coming, uh, are in the blue states. They're in the woke communities that pass all these laws that do, you know, crazy things. We got so much crime and violence out in, in California where this is all started, and, and, and you know, you, you've heard that you've heard the thing. Well, it, it's in Danvers now. We've got kids in Danvers, I read, that are going into CVS, grabbing stuff, and walking out. Okay, so what, what's next? Okay, so again, you know, bad law ends up to have bad culture. Okay, so and that's where we are, but. Today we're talking about education and what's going to happen in Danvers. So all I'm asking is to, let's listen to Mike, see what he's got going, you know, what, what his uh, take is on, on the law, because he, he spent a lot of time. I kind of, I tried, but I, I just can't do it. So that's <laughs> bring, in the, bring in the big gun. But, but I will say that every parent, you really need to talk to your teachers, talk to your principals, and say, hey, how, are we, how is Danvers implementing this? What, what's happening? What are the details, you know? You can look at all the pretty, you know, they, it's like marketing, right? <laughs> you know, buy this product and your life will be perfect. Well, it's never perfect. <laughs> but it's the, you know, when you actually start using it, this is what happens, okay? So without further ado, this is Michael King from uh, MFI, uh, Massachusetts Family Institute, and he's got some information on this stuff that I think we need to know. All right. Good to be with you. How many, just raise your hand, are familiar with MFI in here? Okay, good. So maybe half of you. That's that's better than normal, which is great. 
Um, I was actually at a meeting the other day at Lexington. I asked the same question, and 90% of the crowd said they were familiar with MFI, which was great. Uh, the lady that's speaking here, I think, speaks about you know what a lot of parents are doing, right? She moved from New York to where? Florida. Florida, right? Statistics show that a thousand people a day were moving to Florida, uh, and I think a lot for education freedom, uh, and that's. Uh, an amazing movement going on across the nation, and I'll touch on that. I know we're not here to talk about education freedom, uh, but there really is an amazing movement on education freedom. Uh, just north of here in New Hampshire, there's a great story about that that I'll, I'll touch on as well. Maybe <coughs> we'll be moving to New Hampshire soon, I don't know. Um, but what I wanted to do tonight was just kind of give you a brief overview, because you all, we have grandparents in here, we have parents in here, you know, I don't know where most of you are on this particular issue of sex ed in our schools. So I want to kind of uh, do a general education and then let's talk about some practical things we can do. And then here in this room, there's already heroes in this room that have been making a difference on a local level in your town or city that we've already been working with you. And I think it'd be good to hear those stories as well so you can be encouraged that you can actually have victory here in Massachusetts. So I always like to start here because this is who I am. So this is my family. This is why I do what I do. I'm sure it's why you do what you do because family is so important. Mm -hmm. And if we lose the family, we lose the culture, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, my wife, Ashley, is here with me tonight. Mm -hmm. And then these are our four boys and our daughter. So we have uh, Jesse, Levi, Daisy, Judah, and Ezra. So I like to say we have an Old Testament tribe. <laughs> and uh, Daisy is actually adopted, but you never know it, right? Doesn't she look just like my wife? Yes, she does. But their baby pictures are identical. Wow. So when we adopt her at two, we all had goosebumps because we're like, wait a minute, is that our daughter that we never knew? <laughs> Uh, so, for those of you that are not familiar with MFI, this is our shared mission dedicated to strengthening the family and Judeo Christian values upon which the family is based. And it's a nationwide partnership, and I want you guys to get this. So, we are the local associate of Focus on the Family. How many of you guys are familiar with Focus on the Family? Dr. James Dobson, okay. Uh, we're also affiliated with Alliance Defending Freedom. How many of you guys are familiar with Alliance Defending Freedom? Okay, so everybody should be familiar with these organizations like Alliance Defending Freedom. This is a $50 million pro bono Christian attorney organization that is there to protect your First Amendment rights, okay? So how many of you, when you go look to a, a First Amendment attorney, uh, have a successful time finding one, right? There, there's not many out there. Uh, but ADF, um, <clears throat> Liberty Council, First Liberty, okay, these are national organizations that are there for free to support you. Okay, so I know we're not here to talk necessarily about religious liberty, but religious liberty is under attack today. Okay, uh, even the vaccine issue has been highly controversial. Many people have lost their jobs because they they decided my body, my choice, and the employer wasn't okay with that. Well, ADF and other organizations like us, help to save people's jobs over the past three years, okay? So I just put that out there, that if you have a free speech issue, if you have a religious liberty issue, you know, if you guys heard of the 12-year-old boy, Liam Morrison, uh, in uh, Middleborough, right? He wore a shirt to school that said there's only two genders, okay? And then he got sent home by the principal because it was harming other students. And so we got in touch with the family within 24 hours, and we said to Liam, hey, Liam, why don't you go wear the shirt, that shirt, just a little different nuanced message, but wear it next Friday. So what do you think Liam did? He went back and wore the, pretty much the same shirt. Principal sent him home again, uh, and now he has a, a case that's going before the First Circuit uh, in Boston, and hopefully it'll make its way to Supreme Court to be a victory for free speech uh, coming out of Massachusetts, of all places. So again, yeah, so, so just know that your First Amendment rights can be protected, and we, as your local representative of Massachusetts Family Institute, want to be there for you, okay? And then these orange states represent where there is an MFI, okay, for uh, these First Amendment rights, and also uh, the sanctity of life as well. 
And then also the Family Research Council, so is Tony Perkins. If you're familiar with Tony Perkins, they're our national partner. Um, they're down in D.C., so they do on a national level what we do on a state level. So we care about, we still care about the definition of marriage between one man and one woman. Uh, we still care about religious liberty, of course, and then the sanctity of life, both at the beginning of life and the end of life. Now, I, again, I know we're here to talk about education, but I want to just spend a little moment encouraging you. How many of you guys could use a little encouragement, right? <laughs> all right, so I have the unique opportunity to go all over the state of Massachusetts and talk at churches mostly, many times groups like this, okay? If you go to the Secretary of State's office, they will tell you that there's 8,000 churches in Massachusetts. That's a lot of churches if you think about it. Mm -hmm. Everyone says Massachusetts is very unchurched. Right? I would beg to differ. We have an incredibly large immigrant church as well here in Massachusetts, and they agree with us Okay, in droves. I've seen it for myself. Uh, so I'll just give you some examples of where we've been. This is the largest church in Massachusetts, Jubilee in Mattapan, with almost 5,000 members. Guys, I want you to get this. This is Lawrence, Massachusetts. This church is called Ebenezer. It is the mother church of over 100 Hispanic churches just in the city of Lawrence. Wow. wow. Did you guys know there was over 100 Hispanic churches just in Lawrence? Yeah. Yeah. Did you guys know, and again, I'm not here to talk about drugs tonight, and this is a controversial issue to some extent, but when we were fighting for, uh, we didn't want to see another youth addiction epidemic with recreational marijuana in 2016 when Massachusetts passed it, did you know that 200 people from the Hispanic churches in Lawrence showed up at their city hall in, Fe in July of 2017, they were the first city to say, we don't want recreational marijuana in our city. And so Lawrence was the first city to ban wow. recreational marijuana in the city. That's pretty cool. Did you guys know that? No. You, didn't, you didn't hear that at the Globe? <laughs> uh, here's another really large church. This is an 1,100 member church in Lynn, of all places. Did you guys know there was a 1,000 member church in Lynn? Uh, another great church here, even Joe Free in Westfield. I love this one. This is a Russian Pentecostal church, 800 attendees in Westfield, Massachusetts. They just started a school because so many kids are leaving the public mm -hmm. school. And so two years ago, like many churches, and I'll talk about this, started a <coughs> learning center or school. We'll talk more about that. This uh, is a, a church in Marlboro. They have five campuses. They have over 3,000 people at this event that we spoke at. So I'm trying to show you guys that you are not alone here in Massachusetts. Okay. Another great church. Uh, we work with three wonderful churches here in Waltham as well. Um, so tonight, I want to talk a little bit about CSE. Let's go to CSE, Comprehensive Sexuality Education. Sounds great, doesn't it? Everybody wants comprehensive something, right? But uh, this is not what you might think it is. Um, and so let's go over just real quick the 15 harmful elements of CSE. And first of all, this sexualizes children. And again, this is in about 99% of Massachusetts public schools. Okay? The only public schools that this is probably not in would be Lemonster, Massachusetts. You guys know where Lemonster is? The Twin Cities, Fitchburg and Lemonster, North Central Massachusetts, okay? Up 190, where Route 2 and where it meets Route 2. The reason you don't have comprehensive sex education in Lemonster is because four dads just won four spots on the school committee and decided they didn't want this nonsense in the school. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And a lot of the, the answers to your questions tonight is really you've got to take back the levers of power at the school board. Okay? And I know that sounds uh, you know, like a hard hill to climb, uh, but be inspired by the Ford ads, okay? I was just talking to two ladies here that are running for a school committee in Newburyport, um, so we're excited about that as well. Uh, teach children to consent to sex, and again, this is kindergarten through 12th grade, okay? Many times actually in preschool as well. Uh, normalizes anal and oral sex, promotes homosexual, bisexual behavior, 
promotes sexual pleasure, promotes solo mutual masturbation, promotes condom use in inappropriate ways, promotes early sexual autonomy. I'm going through these rather quickly because uh, they're all just not something you'd want to have your children exposed to here. Fails to establish abstinence as the expected norm. Promotes transgender ideology, promotes contraception and abortion to children. It actually promotes a website called abortionfinder.com, okay? Where you can put in your zip code and find the nearest abortion clinic to your <coughs> child. Promotes peer-to-peer -peer sex ed or sexual rights advocacy, undermines traditional values and belief. That's a big one. Many times, parents will come to me and say, you know, my, my kids are coming home and saying, mom and dad, you're out of touch regarding your traditional understanding of gender, of orientation, of abstinence, okay? Why do you think your kids are saying that? Because this is being normalized for 35 hours a week at school, not just from teachers, but from peers as well. Undermines parents or parental rights. You guys are seeing this like in towns like Ludlow, right? If you know where Ludlow is, you just there's a federal case that we actually lost on a state level that's getting up to the First Circuit now, where the school is hiding gender transition from parents. Uh, so we had two plaintiffs that were bringing a lawsuit, and uh, they lost on a state level, but we're hoping that will go uh, up to the uh, First Circuit. Uh, undermines parents' parental rights, and they refer children to harmful resources. Okay, so these are the 15 elements of comprehensive sex education that we are concerned about. Now, how many of you guys raise your hand if you're from Danvers? Let me from Danvers. Okay, great. So a lot of you. Okay, if you have a cell phone and you want to find out what they're teaching specifically in Danvers, okay, you can text the word. Now, I'm to do this now. You can text the word Danvers to our short code, 87891, okay? Text the word Danvers to 87891. Within 30 seconds, you should get a return text, because I just did it to make sure it works, all right? And it will give you an analysis that I think Marcy Anthony did for us. Uh, she has a lot of these analyses. Uh, and, um, you can use that to understand what's going on in Danvers. Now, one of the curricula that they're teaching in Danvers is called Our Whole Lives, and we'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. Uh, so here are some of the curriculum Get Real from Planned Parenthood, Our Whole Lives from the United, um, United it's a church, I forget what the name of the church is, but anyway, I can't believe it's a church that's putting this out. And then it's uh, Making Proud Choices from uh, Planned Parenthood. Uh, you also have Rights, Respect, Responsibility from Advocates for Youth um, and many other uh, names for really all the same stuff. And this all comes down from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education known as DESI. Okay? So your principal, your superintendent many times will say, hey, don't kill the messenger. I'm just doing what DESI wants me to do. Right? But we will find that you, you, know, you don't necessarily always need to follow what DESI is telling you to do. These are guidelines. So I mentioned these, um, this is it, the Unitarian Universalist Association and the United Church of Christ. I'm sure that the Lord would be proud of that curriculum. <laughs> and then making proud choices. Okay, so I just want to show you a little bit about what's in these curricula. Now, I always tell people I want to keep this rated G, but I guarantee you it's not rated G at school. Okay? So this is 11-year-olds, sixth grade Planned Parenthood, get real curriculum. Discusses getting a girl drunk so a boyfriend can make out with her. A lot of role play that insinuates things is found in these curricula. Introduces masturbation by older brother. Involves scenario with sexually active older sibling making younger child keep it a secret from parents. Again, get real, um, 12 year olds, seventh grade, list of dating behaviors includes touching under a partner's clothes and having sex. 
explains that a dental dam is placed over the vulva or anus during oral sex and that saran wrap can be used for this purpose. At one of the hearings at the State House, we actually went out and bought nine rolls of saran wrap and handed them out to each person on the Joint Committee saying, did you know that this is a contraceptive that's being promoted at your local school? No joke. There's actually a video of a lady that is explaining why saran wrap is good in a pinch. Presents role-playing scenario where a boy asks a girl if they can try having sex without a condom and the boy says he can pull out before he comes. Again, guys, how old are these kids? 12 years old, okay? This is under the legal age uh, where you can have these kinds of relationships. Get real by Planned Parenthood again. Eighth grade material is young as 13 year olds. Normalizes child sex, introduces the idea of multiple <coughs> sexual partners, discusses places where teens can obtain protection methods for free or little cost, which many times is at your uh, health clinic at your school. Okay? And this has become a major issue where the on site health clinic is giving. Uh, contraceptive, sometimes even things like the depo shot, which is three months of birth control, into your 12-year-old girl's arm without parental consent, but for a headache, if you need to get a Tylenol, what do you need? <laughs> parental consent. The New England Journal of Medicine came out with a study saying that if you use this kind of contraceptive, like the depo shot, early, and often, it can lead to certain types of cancer. Mom and dad might want to know what's going on at the on-site health clinic. Encourage children they have a right to seek out sexual pleasure because all kids, once they're born, have sexual rights. This is from the grade 8 student workbook, Get Real from Planned Parenthood. So you see up here it says wait, and then you see how well does it work 100% of the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly, that's biological, right? That would be great. But look at all, so they say, oh yeah, we teach abstinence, but look at all the other options available to the eighth grader, uh, including what I just mentioned, the depot shot. And then if that wasn't concerning enough, again, you have a whole other list here including what was uh, mentioned earlier, the dental dam uh, for contraceptive. And then the books that come into the curriculum. It's perfectly normal. Um, this, is a, this is in many of the Planned Parenthood curriculum. And this is reading for 10 to 15 year olds from Planned Parenthood to get a real curriculum and is a core text in Our Whole Lives, which again is here in Danvers. Okay? Our Whole Lives is used in Danvers. Uh, it contains 67 nude illustrations including children masturbating, adults having sex, and a male putting on a condom. Okay, so you want to know if this book, that would be a good question, is it's perfectly normal being taught to kids in Danvers. Uh, this is our whole lives. So here are some examples from the curriculum here in Danvers, grades 4 through 6, ages 10 through 12, divided in 10 workshops and utilizes this sexually explicit book is perfectly normal, has a core text, asserts that sexuality is something you have from the moment you are born, sexual rights. A section called When Would I encourages children to consider what age they might be when they watch pornography, let someone see them nude, bathe or shower with someone, masturbate with someone, or have sexual intercourse with someone. Or this, this is, again, grades four through six. And then again, affirms gender fluidity and nonconformity. Uh, it might surprise you guys, you're here in Danvers, well, not too far south from here in Lexington. Uh, again, not a town that I would consider to be conservative by any means. Um, Lexington had 1,700 people sign a petition that they were concerned that gender ideology was being taught in the elementary school. So again, yeah, you are not alone.
That's a big number for any town or city. 1,700 people, right? So I just want you guys to know, you know, again, this theme that you're not alone. So many parents feel the same way you do, okay? Uh, I'll give you a quick story. I just got off the phone with a, a father of nine children in Burlington, Massachusetts, and he was upset uh, that September, and basically every month of the year, was celebrating some kind of LGBTQ uh, during the school year, right? It was all over the school calendar. And September, if you didn't know, was Trans Awareness Month, right? Now, it's not that we're being, we're not gonna be empathetic or compassionate to, you know, people, to young kids that are confused about their gender, Okay, even though we're aware that it's a social contagion caused by our schools. Um, but the father went into the assistant superintendent, called for a meeting, a private meeting, and said, look, do you guys know the history of Trans Awareness Month? And the assistant superintendent had no idea. And while the father is asking these questions, the assistant superintendent is looking through Wikipedia to find the answer. Okay, not that that's a great resource. But anyway, um, he was able to convince the assistant superintendent and eventually a superintendent to take the calendar off the website. He also was able, the, his kids went back to the middle school that following week and they said, Dad, all the pride flags have been taken down at school as well. Okay, the power of one father to have one conversation with the assistant super the assistant superintendent okay. okay so this isn't always you know like hey we need this 10-step plan and you know we need to execute it boom, 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 boom. no like sometimes it's just a conversation that you need to have to hold people accountable because this father found out that the assistant superintendent was just rubber stamping everything that came down from Desi and had no idea why they were celebrating Trans Awareness Month. And then the father says, oh, did you know that in the Catholic Church, September is actually Sanctity of Life Month? And oh yeah, we do care about the 35 trans people that took their lives and we want to remember them in Day of Silence during September, okay? But did you know that 63 million babies died since 1973? And don't you think maybe we should celebrate that or remember, not celebrate that, remember that in September? And so no one had ever called the assistant superintendent on the carpet on that stuff. And many of our schools, and I, I want this to really be an important point that you remember, many of our schools have two particular policies that have already been adopted. No political bias. And when you teach controversial issues, you need to teach both sides, okay? So, when, so, so much of the answer is found at your school board, okay? So that, you know, the four dads, for example, in Lemonster, right? Once they had the majority, they could actually do something, okay? And so, again, these policies are already in place. So if you, like this father, went and got a meeting and said, look, hey, can you show me your no political bias? Uh, uh, policy that you have in place, right? Because it seems like you, you have a lot of political bias when you're teaching one side, but not the other. Or how about your controversial issues policy? It seems that you're teaching all this stuff about LGBTQ, but you're not having any detransitioner like Katie Anderson come in and tell her side of the story where she had her breasts cut off and her ovaries and her fallopian tubes and her uterus taken out at age 20 and is now detransitioning, and she'd love to come speak at your school. Actually, she just spoke with us in Foxborough, and she actually talked to three 11-year-old girls. I was there just two weeks ago on a Friday night in Foxborough. One of the 11-year-old girls says, hey, I, never, I just thought that if I was gonna be in the arts at school, I had to be LGBTQ. That's literally what the 11-year-old thought. And so she talked to Katie Anderson, and Katie said, no, that's not the case. Look at me. I'm actually transitioning from that lifestyle. And so the 11-year-old came out and said, wow, so I don't have to be, I don't have to, you know, be LG I can be just who I am, right? It was, it, was, it was unbelievable, right? And that side of the story, guys, is never 
pod. So again, what am I saying? You have a controversial issues policy and you have a no political bias policy that many times is already at your school, okay? So some of those tools are already available to you. You just don't know about them, okay? Real quick, yeah. Does MFI dabble in the federal law that prohibits the distribution of obscene materials to minors under 16? Uh, we, we don't, and I'm not an attorney, okay? Uh, but what I've heard from attorneys is that pornography is very difficult to define legally. Um, so it's a very difficult thing to, um, like in our local school libraries, it's a difficult thing to eradicate. Okay, uh, from a legal perspective. Now, that might not be the answer anybody wants to hear, quite frankly, uh, but that's what I hear from attorneys. So, if anybody has a different answer on that, because you know, I've been told that you know, you go to 20 accountants and you can have your taxes done 20 different ways. Okay, you probably go to a, 20 attorneys and find out you know, nuanced information. So, if you guys have a different answer on that, I'm, I'm all ears, but that's, that's been my understanding. Uh, our whole lives, again, here in Danvers, grade seven through nine, teaches outer course defined as love making without penetration inside vagina, anus, or mouth. Again, this is uh, grade seven through nine, guys. Outer course activities might include hot talk, sexy stares, erotic fantasy, spicy role play, sen sensual massage, showering or bathing together, strip tease, mutual masturbation, phone or email sex, and dry sex. Teaches children how to consent to unlawful sexual activity. Well, of course, because they're 13, right? And they're being taught this. I mean, you could make an argument that this is illegal. Uh, again, our whole lives, uh, ages 16 through 18, ask how many sexual partner students have had in the last 30 days. Uh, ask students in which kind of relationship would they be willing to do various activities, such as skinny dipping, stimulating someone's nipples, watching a movie or book, or give fellatio, promotes abortion, encourages students to become sexual rights activists to participate in peer-to-peer -peer sex education. And then making proud choices, a lot of the same thing. Uh, this was a sex ed curriculum that they wanted to pass in Worcester back in 2019. There was about 80 people in this room, okay? Just picture this crowd, February 7th, Thursday night, rainy night, I remember it well, at the Worcester School Committee meeting. 80 of us showed up, said we don't want making proud choices in the Worcester Public Schools, and we won that night in Worcester, right? 80 people in the second largest city in New England. Think about that. This group has that kind of influence, okay? And you have to recognize that, okay? That even though you are small, you are powerful. And so a lot of this is just a lot of the same guys, so I won't necessarily bore you with all the details. Okay, so CSC doesn't meet its objectives, and of course it doesn't. CSC, again, Comprehensive Sex Education pro Proponents claim that their approach to sex ed delays sexual debut in minors and decreases unhealthy risk-taking behaviors. Out of 60 school-based CSC studies examined no evidence of continued effectiveness at reducing teen pregnancy or instance of sexually transmitted infections was found. And it did not achieve additional target outcomes producing an 88% failure rate for delayed sexual activity and a 94% failure rate for reducing unprotected sex for teens. That's not hard to believe, right? When you have that whole chart from grade eight Planned Parenthood giving you all these contraceptive, uh, you know, um, things that are available, and then you have your on-site school clinic, right, promoting this stuff, no parental consent, right? So of course you're not gonna meet your targeted outcomes because you were never going to meet them. You never planned to meet them. Uh, an informed and in charge. Again, this is another sex ed. This is found in Lynn and other towns and cities of Massachusetts. Another comprehensive sex education uh, refers students to the sexuality. Are you guys familiar with this? No. Have you guys heard of the family tree? Wouldn't that be great, right? But we have the sexuality where students are instructed to discuss and list sexual activities such as fetish, fantasy, pornography, abortion, and sex toys 
in sections on the worksheet. The top of the tree is the listing items that might apply to the people you are dating or having sex with. Wouldn't you rather have the family tree back? Refer students to the Scarlatine website where they can read articles like how to approach sexual fantasy and desire on your own terms and buy items from the slippery slope stockpile. So again, informed and in charge by Girls Inc. Uh, here in Lynn, Massachusetts. And then advocates for youth, and uh, I won't go through all the examples here, but again, this is just a partner of Planned Parenthood. Um, and we have the three R's, it's in Revere, it's in Mansfield. I mentioned to you in Worcester in 2019, we defeated Making Proud Choices. Well, do you think Planned Parenthood and its partners just went away? Of course not. Two years later, against the will of the people, against the majority will of the people, they passed the three R's, rights, respect, responsibility. Great marketing, because when you think of the three R's, you might think of reading, yeah. writing, arithmetic, right? But here we have rights, what did I say about rights? Kids' sexual rights, right? Respect and responsibility. Um, and so uh, this is taught, again, Revere, Mansfield, Worcester, many other towns and cities. We told them in Worcester back about two years ago, we said, look, clearly the majority of, of parents have shown up and they don't want it, okay? And if you pass it, this is, what, this is what I told them. I said, if you pass it, you will spark the largest opt-out movement of sex ed in the history of Massachusetts. Okay? Well, that not only came true, it's actually been the largest opt-out movement in the nation, as far as I know. Okay? And I'll get to that in a second. All right. So why are we concerned about the three R's? Multiple uh, excerpts here. And when we give these excerpts to the school officials, they just say, well, you're giving a bunch of disinformation and misinformation, right? And they never will go back to the footnoted information. Again, you can see your grade seven, lesson one, page four of what's in the three R's. And guys, this is a kindergarten through 12th grade curriculum. So thanks to uh, ladies like Marcy Anthony at MFI, you now have access to a sex ed map on our website, which this has been much more filled in. Uh, and so we have done public records requests on your behalf, because many times we know if you as a parent go and try and get this information, you are stonewalled, and, or you are given a piece of information that is so sterile that you come back to us and you say, Mike, what are you talking about? Like, I was at your presentation, but none of this is in our curriculum. Oh, because they didn't give you all the information, right? Did you ask to see the entire curriculum? Yeah, well, what did they give you? Oh, just a few pages, maybe a summary, right? And so what we've done, if you indeed have text the word Danvers to 87891, you'll see the analysis that we do for you. And um, if you go on our website and you're not from Danvers, but let's say you're from Newburyport, you can text Newburyport to 87891 and get an analysis of what we've done in Newburyport, okay? <coughs> Newburyport's a great story. If you didn't hear lately in the Boston Globe, uh, the mayor of Newburyport went into the library and tore down a flyer for a uh, event that was being put on by over 100 residents to push back against the gender ideology and this kind of stuff in the public schools. And so <coughs> someone noticed that the mayor had done that, so they called us. We had pro bono attorney, very professional, work on their behalf. And wouldn't you know it, they just got a $10,000 settlement from the city of Newburyport because they violated their rights. Right? So, cool, right? Um, so always reach out to us because you never know, you know, what can happen. And of all, you know, Newburyport of all places, right? We got, we got a significant victory, and now we have <coughs> lovely ladies running our school committee in the city. Uh, so that's that's a great story. So visit our website at mafamily.org. Mafamily.org. And if you go to our resources, you can find the sex ed map 
under the resources. Now I told you about Worcester. So this was that night, February 7th, Thursday, rainy night, right, in Worcester. And these are pictures I took of that night so I could say four years later, hey, this, this happened, okay? And here are <coughs> pictures from that night. It was a full house, as you can see from the pictures. Even the balcony was full. And you can see more pictures here, okay? And we won that night. And what is the result that when I said you will spark the largest opt-out movement in the history of Massachusetts? Well, last year, 4,000 students opted out of sex ed. Now, that's almost 20% of the school system, kindergarten through 12th grade, that opted out of sex ed. One cool story on this is one of the, there's about 40 schools in Worcester, okay? That's my understanding. In a third grade class, half of the class opted out. So when sex ed was being taught, they got up out of their seat, they walked out of the room, perhaps to the library to have an alternative lesson. Guys, what would happen if half of this room just got up? And would that have an impact on you guys, right? So that's impactful when you have half the third grade class. And that's just one example of what's been happening in Worcester. Guys, this was the second year in a row. This wasn't just last year. The first year, I think there were about 3,200 kids that opted out of sex ed. Okay? So Worcester is the epicenter for what we're calling the opt out movement. I was just contacted the other day by a lady, Hispanic lady, running for school school committee in Lynn. And you know what? She found out about the story of Worcester. She's going to try and do the same thing in the city of Lynn. One of the main catalysts to this event happening in Worcester was Chanel Soucy, a single mom, African American, has kids that came up in the Worcester school system ran for school committee, she lost, she had about 6,000 votes, she needed about 9,000 to win, she lost, but she made the opt-out a major part of her platform. And I told her, I said, Chanel, even if you lose, you win. Because you have raised so much awareness to this issue that, I mean, isn't this an incredible win? And if you ran for school committee, and you could say, hey, I helped to spark that. I was the main linchpin for that. That's a huge win. So I always tell people, when you run for school committee, have that vision that, yeah, absolutely, you don't, you're not running to lose. But goodness, if you could do this in your town or city, that'd be amazing. Okay. They, also, they also lost over 2,000 children out of the public schools. Great point. So maybe you got an updated uh, newspaper article because um, it's the Worcester Telegram and Gazette. This was a year ago that I saw a thousand kids left. So now you're saying two thousand kids left the Worcester public schools. We are seeing a public school exit not only nationally but in Massachusetts. Okay, and I'm going to get to this a little more. 2020 guys. In 2020, homeschooling went from 1.5% to 12.1%. It was an 800% increase. It was actually one of the largest increases in the nation, homeschooling. That didn't even include like, you know, parochial schools and Protestant schools and, you know, all the other options that you would have, okay? So, <clears throat> uh, I hope you're encouraged by that. Again, there's many different towns and cities. I have Sharon here just because we have uh, information on Sharon. Uh, I don't know, there's, I'm sure there's many other town cities represented here tonight. So what I would encourage you to do is text your town or city to 87891. If you don't get a return text within 60 seconds, it means we don't have that information quite yet. I know Marcy has about probably 10 more towns on our list that she's getting to right now. Uh, some towns are charging us money, like Newburyport. Uh, Two, almost two years ago was going to charge us $45,000. Okay. 
for, to get the sex ed curriculum. We said, that's ridiculous. <laughs> then they got back to us and said, okay, there's a sale. $8,000, second time. We were like, oh, that's great, thank you so much. No, we said, no, that's not right. And then, uh, the was it the um, Ben Shapiro's <coughs> newspaper, Daily uh, Caller, I think Daily it is. Wire. Daily Wire picked it up, uh, and, and then eventually we got the information, and I don't even think we had to pay for it. Um, so, yeah, that was ridiculous. Um, I think Burlington, or I saw somewhere in the notes is charging us like 50 bucks, so we'll pay that, but we're not gonna pay $45,000. Uh, so, anyway, this is the kind of reaction you're getting from the schools because they're all following DESE, okay? Uh, unless you have Levenster and you got four dads, you know, that win seats on school, on the school committee. Uh, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about frameworks. That's a major reason why you're here. Um, if you want some information we put together on the frameworks, you can text frameworks to 87891. Um, we had, and we still do have information on here where you can contact DESE. That's no longer available because DESE voted, uh, about what, two weeks ago? And surprise, surprise, passed the frameworks. Um, after I'm sure a majority of people from our side said no, uh, but you know, they're just such ideologues, uh, so they passed it anyway. Um, so if you want more information, uh, definitely do that. Text frameworks to 87891. Um, one of the other things we're concerned about is books in the school library. Uh, so a lot of these are pornographic, but you know they call us book banners, right? Because we're anti-LGBTQ and all those different things. But really, we're just we just want appropriate material for our elementary kids. Wouldn't that be nice, right? Um, so we're still this is a tough issue of the question raised before. You know, it gets to the issue really, really where it's very hard to define pornography legally. So it's very hard to say that you can't have these books in the library legally. I'm still not aware of a situation in Massachusetts where there's been a legal case that got a book out of a, out of a library. Um, so definitely though, a, a lot of parents have um, you know, shown up at school on the public sidewalk, again, I'll bring up Newburyport, uh, a 76 year old grandfather, I think, showed up on the public sidewalk, uh, made a big deal with sign, or not really a big deal, he just handed out flyers. Principal got super upset, called the cops. Cops come, intimidate the grandfather, um, and I think the grandfather eventually left the sidewalk, uh, but he got in touch with us and we pushed back on the situation because that public sidewalk is public, okay? So if you wanna go in numbers like um, uh, two grandmothers, one is here tonight, Joanne, where are you? Are you still in here? Joanne Wright? She left. Oh, she left, okay. Joanne Wright is a local hero. Okay, She got our citizenship award at our banquet last year, I think. Um, she showed up at the Worcester. Another reason why 4,000 kids opted out in Worcester was Joanne Wright, who lives on the North Shore, has a grandchild in Worcester, and literally would go down every week and just hand out flyers to parents that were dropping their kids off at school. I mean, amazing, right? Amazing. Well, I tried doing that, and it was invitations to a lecture that actually you were going to be speaking yep. at. And I was on public sidewalk, and they called they, they called out all the teachers to line up next to me, so that way when a person dropped off their child, they would knock me over. And I just had two of my knees replaced, literally, I mean, I didn't fall over, but I could have fallen over. Wow. They would hit me that hard to get to the cars and then ask the girl, are you feeling threatened right now? Are you afraid? Mm. Well, they were putting these ideas in their heads. I mean, yeah. I was just, you know, an old lady passing You're out very the patients. You're mm -hmm. very threatening. <laughs> and they um, called the police on me. <coughs> Two police cars came to uh, watch me. And they told me not to come back, and I didn't, but I probably should have. Yeah. But I well, you can always go back next week. <laughs> <laughs> Take your husband with you. Um, no, but another grandmother uh, named Emily uh, in the town of Woburn, not too far from here, 
uh, did the same thing as Joanne did. And, and uh, Woburn Middle School was going to teach the three R's, okay? And so Joanne passed out flyers that we made for her. And wouldn't you know it, the superintendent, in about two weeks, we, we found out that they, can't, they, they canceled the three R's in the middle school that year. That's pretty cool, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, she was there for like maybe two days handing out flyers. <laughs> One grandmother in the city of Hoover. That's pretty cool, I do, right? So, um, if you're interested in pushing back on the books, you can text the word books to 87891 and get more information on that. Books to 87891. Uh, again, outside groups teaching CSC. This gets to you know what I really think is this controversial issues policy I mentioned before, right? Or the political bias policy, where these guys come in and they teach all about the agenda in school. But do you ever get Katie Anderson in there, the detransitioner, to give the other side of the story, right? I mean, parents should go. Here's Joanne. I was just mentioning you, Joanne Wright. So I said you're a local hero for what you did in Worcester. So, um, you know, push back, use these policies that are most likely already passed in your city or town. Ask for these policies. Do you have a no political bias policy? Do you have a controversial issue policy? They might stonewall you. If they stonewall you, then call us and say, hey, could, you, could your attorneys call the school and, you know, double check, please, right? Because we can send a legal letter, which many times is very effective. Yeah. <coughs> In a dialogue like that, that you're suggesting with a school board member or, or a superintendent, or, do you have a, an alternative curriculum like that would yes. that, that would say, yeah. right, this is not what we think is right, but here's yeah. something positive that we think would be. Yeah. So let me first say okay. this: legally, <clears throat> even with the frameworks passed, there's no legal requirement to teach sex ed, okay? So understand that first, okay? Uh, second, um, there's other curriculum like something like Healthy Futures, mm -hmm. it would be one example, but there's many. Um, there's also other curricula called SRA, which is called Sex, Sexual Risk Avoidance, okay? And this is something I think most of us would be much more okay with, okay? It doesn't get into all the stuff that's not age appropriate, not medically accurate, okay? Um, so anyway, I really want you guys to understand the policies that are already in place. So when these two lovely ladies win their school committee seats, they should challenge those policies, right? Challenge those policies on the school committee level. Even though you're gonna be two out of seven people on that school committee, you can raise that issue, right? And, and make that an issue, put, you know, and put some pressure on that. Um, harmful websites, some of these we had to kind of red dot out because they're so inappropriate. But these are sites that your children are sent to, one called Bedsider, okay? Uh, sex on the first date, yes, no, maybe, okay? So a lot of times it's the websites that are even worse than the curriculum. Um, so I mentioned a lot of this before, just the groups that are doing this. Um, I want to quickly get into some of the trans ideology so you guys can understand you know, what is being taught at school. Uh, so <clears throat> we have transgender, transgenderism is being promoted in our schools through various means, including anti-bullying programs like Jeff Parati's Safe Schools program for LGBTQ youth. Okay, again, if you're gonna teach one side, you gotta teach the other, okay? Uh, storybooks in the classroom, social transitioning parties, CSC, diversity, equity, inclusion directors. I'm sure you've seen the hiring of six-figure DEI directors at your school, uh, which is something that actually, to encourage you, there's a group called Pembroke Rising, and it was started by a guy that used to be a pastor, now he's retired, and he's dedicated his life to fighting DEI in Pembroke. So he started Pembroke Rising, and they just, uh, defeated much of the uh, DEI effort in Pembroke, okay? So it can be done. 
Uh, you don't have to recreate the wheel. You can, I can introduce you to all these people if you want to get involved on your local level to learn more about how to do this stuff. Uh, dangerous transgender ideology. Um, this is one of the books that shows up beyond magenta in your school library. This isn't your town library. This is your school library. Okay, there's a difference. From six up, I used to kiss other guys in my neighborhood, make out with them, perform oral sex on them. I liked it. I used to love oral, and I touched their you-know-whats. We were young. That's what we did. Age eight. Okay, so it's elementary kids uh, being exposed to beyond magenta. That's not even one of the worst, right? Gender queer is the most banned book in the U.S. Okay, we're trying to work with school boards to pass policies like they've done at a sister organization of ours in Pennsylvania where they create a, if you go to the movies and you see like a GP, GP, G13, R, right? This is what we're trying to do is set up a system where you can actually have a policy that says, hey, if this book is rated PG13, well then it can't be in the elementary school library, okay? I think that's a good place to start, okay? And I don't think any of us would want an R-rated book necessarily uh, in the high school, but maybe something like To Kill a Mockingbird or something, right? I mean, we can have some discernment uh, in regard to what's in our school library. Uh, but just keep the, the sexual stuff out. Um, or the inappropriately sexual stuff out. So, uh, gender-bred person, again, this is um, elementary school, okay? Gender unicorn, this is preschool. And did you know there was the gender snow person? Okay, not the snow man, the snow person, okay? Showing up in your local school. They're teaching you, your elementary kids, that your gender identity comes from where? Your brain. Did your gender come from your brain? Or did it come from your anatomy, right? Um, your attraction comes from where? Your heart, so whatever your heart says regarding orientation, <clears throat> follow your heart. And then your sex comes from your anatomy. Okay, so your sex has nothing to do with what? <laughs> your gender. Did you guys know that? And did you know now that Desi got so upset with us with what's going on in Worcester that now they're saying gender identity is not sex ed? Have you heard this? because they don't want kids to opt out. So you must take the gender ideology curriculum. All right? So that's where Desi's going with this. Preschool, how many spectrums are here? Five. Five spectrums for a four-year-old to understand, you know, what is female, what is male, what are other genders, what is masculine, what is feminine, um, sex assigned at birth, the doctor, we have a doctor in the room, right? Uh, did you ever assign someone's gender at birth, right? <laughs> some, I mean, by looking at their anatomy, of course, but some, there was this TikTok video from a first grade teacher that said, how in the world does a doctor ever know what the gender is at birth? if the child hasn't had enough time to decide. <laughs> right? So if that was not concerning enough, this came to us from the North Shore, okay, parent. Guys, this was five years ago, okay? Five years ago. What does it say at the top? It says, our sexuality and gender identity are not set in stone. In fact, people's identities can be fluid the spectrum can help you visualize how you feel at any given time. Mark how you identify today in each line, but don't feel limited. It's okay to mark something different when? Come on. So your gender can change in 24 hours? Is that medically accurate? No. Thank you, doctor. <laughs> Question, comment. As a child in the school system who is currently learning at home because of disability and who is supposed to be learning this, I am nauseated by the information that they are willing to, to put into ch in children's heads 
Gender expression, how the world sees you. What if you're that 12-year-old boy, no, better yet, what if you're that 12-year-old tomboy, right? That girl that likes to do traditionally boy things. And if you look at this and you say, well, how does the world see me? How are you going to answer that as a 12-year-old tomboy? Are you going to think that you're fully woman? When your teacher's telling you not to go along with all the gender stereotypes of society, right? And so instead of being maybe 100% woman, maybe you're 70%, and now look what you're doing. You're on the spectrum, and you're questioning. And that is why most of the kids that transition and get confused are young girls. This was put out by the Trevor Project. Uh, did you guys see the um, Sam Brinton? I don't know if that name rings a bell. Okay. Yeah. Sam Brinton is, he was leading this before our current administration hired him, I think in the energy department, I want to say. He's now known as the luggage thief. You saw that story? Okay. Sam Brinton used to go around to Google and all these corporations and promote this ideology. Okay. So that's who's behind the Trevor Project. Um, Catholic School in Shrewsbury, as a ministry partner, had a dress down day where kids could wear jeans, pay $2, and guess where the money went? Trevor Project. Oh. Um, so this isn't only happening at your public school, it's happening in some private schools as well. Okay. So just be aware. I always tell people, even though you're choosing that local private school, you got to know what's going on. Okay. Even some Christian schools, even here on the North Shore. Okay. I, would, I, I wouldn't say don't send your kids there, but I would just say, hey, be aware. Maybe there might just be one thing during the year that I would be like, Maybe that's questionable, whatever, right? But hey, know what's going on, okay? Because sometimes it can take one book to throw a kid off, okay? Uh, and then real quick, just some stuff about the transgender stuff. Um, so in the just seven years, there's been nearly a 2,000% increase in children seeking treatment for sexual identity confusion in the United Kingdom. Uh, I talked about this, social contagion. One study showed that when a teen announces a transgender identity to their peer group, the number of friends who also become transgender identified was 3.5 per group, okay? So why does 2 plus 2 not equal 4 anymore, right? Because there is a social contagion going on where there's all this peer pressure where that 12-year-old tomboy is feeling pressure and is no longer thinking straight, okay? What, is the, what do they always tell us? If you don't have, if your child does not have the uh, surgery, they're going to kill themselves, right? Isn't that what we hear? Yeah. Right? Okay. Well, what are the stats? After sex reassignment surgery, transgender identified people are nearly 20 times more likely to die from suicide than the general population. Did you need a study to tell you that? No. no. When you mess with the natural body, when you start putting testosterone into a young girl's body that's not supposed to be there, you mess with that little girl, okay? Up to 98% of children who struggle with their sex as a boy or girl come to accept their sex by adulthood. Okay, this is a huge statistic. So why in the world are we giving puberty blockers to 12-year-olds when we know statistically by the time they turn 19, 20, 21, they're going to be comfortable in their anatomical skin. Guys, that is abuse. That is abuse to give puberty blockers when you know that 9.8 out of 10 people <coughs> are going to feel comfortable once they go through puberty and through adolescence. Uh, and then also, girls as young as 13 are undergoing double mastectomies. Have you guys seen Chloe Cole? Right? 
uh, on Jordan Peterson and other uh, podcasts. Okay, she's uh, she was just with us uh, on the Cape. Uh, boys as young as 17 are undergoing full genital sex reassignment surgeries. Uh, Long-term effects of purity blockers, cross-sex hormones have not been studied. Um, you can't get away from nature. Science demonstrates that there are two sex chromosomes, two X chromosomes in females and an X and a Y in males, in nearly every single cell in our bodies. If you listen to the testimony of Katie Anderson, detransitioner I mentioned earlier, right? Had her top cut off, bottom taken out, okay? We'll never have kids, right? She will tell you that when she had the surgery, she had the boy haircut, she goes in the bathroom, and she can't stop seeing herself as a girl. And she tried so hard to become a boy, right? Because she can't get away from nature. Some transgender identified patients are being prescribed process hormones on their very first visit. <clears throat> Katie Anderson, again, testifies of this. And then we see boys and girls sports all over the place, right? But again, nature tells us all these different things between, that are differences between men and women. We all know the story of Leah Thomas, right? At the University of Pennsylvania, who when, she, when he um, swims against other boys, he's ranked 500, but when he swims against girls, he's number one, right? That's not fair, right? <coughs> uh, also, we see here men have broader shoulders, again, just physiologically, okay? They have advantages in sports like volleyball, swimming, and basketball. Uh, uh, male marathon runners have lower body fat percentages than female marathon runners. Men have a greater amount of fast uh, twitch muscle fibers, which gives them explosive power. Do I sound like a misogynist? A misogynist? <laughs> <laughs> and all, on, on average, men are physically stronger than women. Men have 66% more upper body muscle than women and 50% more lower body muscle. There is a 10% performance gap between male and female athletes in most sports, and it hasn't narrowed as women train harder. And men have higher hemoglobin levels, allowing their body to oxygenate muscles more quickly and efficiently. And then lastly, men have larger hearts and lungs. I always tell my wife, I have a large heart. <laughs> <laughs> a larger heart can pump more blood to the body, and larger lungs allow for the body's tissues to receive more oxygen. Men have bigger and stronger bones. A larger structural skeleton means men's bodies can hold more muscle, and larger bones facilitate leverage. And men are taller, giving them an average advantage in sports like basketball or volleyball. But you didn't need me to give you st those statistics. You knew them already. Uh, encouraging note, United Kingdom's National Health Service shut down its children gender clinic, which was fabulous. Uh, in many ways, they're ahead of us, unfortunately. Uh, if you'd like some really helpful information on this issue, you want talking points, uh, we put together a really great resource for you. So please take advantage of that. Text gender to 87891. You want to be like that dad with nine kids that goes to the assistant superintendent and has a good argument to make? One of the reasons is he's been educated. Okay. So text the word gender to 87891. Uh, if you text your town or city name to our short code, but you do not get a return text, text the word education to our short code, and you will get a general parent forum-like presentation via video. And then you'll also get, like you would if you texted your town or city name, an opt-out form in both Spanish and English. Okay? I'll get to your question real quick. I just, I'm almost done with this. And then we'll have some Q&A. Parents looking for school options, again, uh, huge public school exit going on in Massachusetts. Um, if you want to know what options are available in your neck of the woods, we put together a list of about 100 different schools and what we're calling church-based learning centers uh, that are popping up all over the state. So please take advantage of this. School option to 87891. 
If you're part of a community that wants to start a pod or a micro school or a learning center, these are all you know, many different names, but the same thing, okay? Text the word pod to 87891. You'll see a video of me and Dr. Adam Rondeau talking to a pastor that started a pod at their church. Uh, we recently had with 13 church-based learning centers start in the past two years okay, as an answer to all these kids leaving public schools. I'll give you two quick examples. The Westfield Learning Center in Westfield, Massachusetts teaches 60, almost 60 kids, uh, uh, K-4 through 12th grade, Monday, <coughs> Wednesday, Friday, for $500 per family per year. Wow. Is that affordable? Yes. Do you need a school voucher for that? Probably not, right? So we're creating our own school voucher program by encouraging churches who have what? Affordable space during the week and also have what? People that want to minister in this way. They're not necessarily served by teachers, but, you know, talk to Marcy. She raised seven kids that are highly successful and they're all homeschooled, okay? So it can be done. You don't have to be a certified teacher to do it, okay? So, uh, and then the largest Hispanic church in Worcester started a learning center last year. They had three kids last year. This year they have 60, and they do preschool through 12th grade, $200 a month, okay? So it can be done. Five days a week, by the way, five days a week. Uh, you want to run for school committee, text the word school to 87891, okay? We offer training. But, I mean, do you think Danvers would be changed if, you know, 20 of you ran for school committee, right? I mean, four dads changed Lemonster, okay? So if you can catch the vision here, text the word school to 87891, uh, and we will notify you when we have our trainings, okay? They're online and in person. Um, just want to encourage you, the largest Hispanic church in Somerville, called Vida Real, wanted to start a Christian school last year. Somerville says, well, you got to teach LGBTQ if you're going to get approved. Now, it's a Christian school, right, that believes a certain way about Genesis 127, God made them what? Male and female, right? So they're... They have every right to have that belief, right? I think we'd all agree. And so we showed up at the school committee meeting, and we got them an eight to one decision so they could get their Christian school started without being discriminated, right? Or told what they had to do. I mentioned the Ludlow case where the parents are not getting the information about gender transition. This is making its way up to the First Circuit. Um, <clears throat> and then another great victory, the uh, MIAA, the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association, was forcing all student athletes to sign the DEI pledge, okay, I don't know if you guys saw this or not, but this is what it looks like, and we were concerned about number eight, support the diversity, equity, inclusion, sportsmanship, and game officials committees policy programs within the MIAA at all school functions. Now as a parent, you read that and you're like, yes, this sounds great. You have no idea the slippery slope that you're signing when now you're okay with men being on your girls' mm -hmm. swim team, mm -hmm. right? And so our attorneys called the MIAA said, this is compelled speech. You cannot force a student to do this. And the MIAA called their attorneys, and their attorneys said, yeah, we can't enforce this. What are you guys, crazy? <laughs> and so we won just by shedding sunlight on it, okay? They changed it. They changed, that's and right. You send a uh, letter. That's right. MFI sent a legal letter to Newburyport, and I think the very next day they took it off the website. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, four great stories in Newburyport. Of all places, right? <laughs> Newburyport, <laughs> uh, So, resources for parents in schools. Again, I said text word education. Um, if you're not on Massachusetts Informed Parents, how many of you guys have heard of Massachusetts Informed Parents on Facebook? Okay, I'm always pleasantly surprised by that. That's a lot of people that just raised their hand. 10,000 people are on this site. Um, that is a great place to meet other parents and see what's going on around the state of Massachusetts regarding these issues. So if you want immediate community on this, uh, go to Massachusetts Informed Parents on Facebook. So what can you do? Find out what is happening in your school district. Opt your child out of sex ed. 
Join MIP, Massachusetts Board of Parents on Facebook. If I know this bike might be able to do the same. Schedule a parent form, like tonight, for your church or community group. Petition your school district to teach SRA, I talked about this, sex risk avoidance instead of CSE, comprehensive sex education. Run for school committee, start a local parents group, and homeschool or private school. If you did not hear any of these stories in the globe, and you'd like to hear these stories, subscribe to the New Boston Post, and you will hear these stories. Okay? So is a wonderful online magazine, okay, newbostonpost.com, uh, and you can get all these stories right to your inbox. And lastly, uh, visit our website, mafamily.org, um, for more information on all this. Before you leave, please leave your cell phone and email address, especially if you do not get our information, um, and you can you can leave that up here because I always tell people it would be a waste of your time and my time if we had this conversation tonight and then we did nothing about it, right? So if you want to continue to get you know information from us, <coughs> leave your cell phone, leave your email address. Um, you know, I was I was at a church in Fitchburg two weeks ago. I gave a similar message. I had a hundred texts after the service. It's pretty cool. You know that Russian Pentecostal church? Guess how many people sign up for our text alert in one morning? I was like, I was it was the first time being uh, translated in Russian, and so everybody was deadpan. And I'm like, okay, are you with me? Or like, what's going on? And 295 people signed up that morning. Pretty cool. It was threatened in Russian. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So anyway, uh, we have about 20 minutes until we got to get out of here. So um, happy to take some questions or comments. Uh, yeah, start with Marcy. Uh, you mentioned petitions earlier. Yeah. Will MFI help someone draw up a petition? Um, yes, for sure. Like the petition in Lexington, where you had 1,700 people sign because they didn't want transgenderism in the elementary school, for sure. Okay, it's very effective. Um, yes, sir. Uh, can we get the PDF? Of this yes. Yep. So if you leave your email address and put PDF in the margin, I'll get it to you. Okay. Let me quickly uh, go over this because I want to give you a little bit more information on the frameworks, okay? Uh, did we bring these? All right, do you think, Amanda, you can pass those out? Um, so just real quick questions on the frameworks. What are Massachusetts curriculum frameworks? Um, I think to a large extent you guys know, this comes from, from DESE, uh, documents designated to standardize education across Massachusetts public schools so that all students learn substantially similar academic content, okay? Um, the frameworks provide teachers, students, and families with clear and shared expectations for what all students should know and be able to do at the end of each year. Key word in there being should, okay? Not must, should. Frameworks establish curriculum standards but do not prescribe any specific curriculum, okay? So again, do you have to teach sex ed in Massachusetts? No, okay? DESE also, who creates the curriculum frameworks? DESE draft the curriculum frameworks and the Massachusetts Board of Elementary and Secondary Education ratifies them. So you have DESE making them and DESE passing them, okay? What features of the new comprehensive health and physical education framework are most concerning? The standards within the new framework being sensitive topics into the school public class from beginning with the youngest learners and you can read this for yourself, but I just went through a ton of this with you, okay, in terms of the concerning material in the sex ed. So if you're from Danvers, little mini quiz. So I want to remember what the name of the curriculum is, at least one of them, put out by the Church of Christ. Our whole lives, okay, our whole lives, okay. So if you text the word Danvers to 87891, you'll get more information. If you want to flip the page, we'll go to the question, are schools required to follow the curriculum frameworks? This is very important, guys, okay? 
for the core subjects of mathematics, science, and technology, history and social science, English, foreign languages, and the arts, the frameworks are functionally mandatory for schools. What did you not hear in that sentence? Sex ed. For other subjects, including health and sex education, there is no law requiring that schools follow the frameworks. Bessie evaluates school performance on an annual basis. One of the factors it uses in these evaluations is whether a school has effectively instructed students in core subjects according to the Bessie's curriculum frameworks. However, schools are not evaluated by their adherence to the frameworks for health or sex education. That's important to know. Okay? Schools are not evaluated for their adherence to the frameworks for health or sex education. So if Bessie's going to get on your case for performance, right, for curriculum, well, they can't get on your case for not teaching sex ed, okay, or whatever curriculum you want to choose. Therefore, local school districts are not required to implement Bessie's new comprehensive health and physical education framework in their health and sex education curricula. This is why I love to find, and we have two, at least two, school committees that may create a, a proclamation saying, hey, we're not going to do Bessie's frameworks. Wouldn't that be great, right? And then I could get up here and say, hey, you know those four dads in Lemonster? They just signed a proclamation, right? They said no frameworks, okay? Um, so anyway, I think these answer a lot of the core questions that you might have had coming in tonight about the frameworks, okay? And then I want to take some time like I did tonight just to explain why are we so concerned about the frameworks and then what can you do to push back and then giving you some personal stories here in the room of how people have pushed back and been successful, okay? Um, so any final comments or questions that you guys might have? Yeah. Where do you get the form for a child to opt out for the parents have a child to opt out? Yep, so if you text the word Danvers, to 87891, you got a return, Who's, has anyone done that tonight and gotten a return text? Yep. Got a return text? Yep. Okay. Do you see the link? Did yep. you see the link for the opt-out form? Yep. Yep. It's in English and Spanish. Okay. So copy and paste that and send it to your friends as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's one way you can do it. You can text education to 87891. Get it, or you can go on our website under resources and get the opt-out form as well. You give it to the principal. You hand deliver it. Good question though. Be vigilant, parents. Just because you hand in the thing doesn't mean they're going to be okay with it. Guys, the Nativity School in Worcester, okay, this is not a public school, 8th grade ESL class teaching sex ed, 8th grade mom opts out. Alternative lesson is how are Mattel trans dolls good for society? Okay? Hello? That's the Nativity School. All right, so just because you hand in that paper doesn't mean they're going to be okay. So if they don't abide by your wishes, you contact us, okay? Because you're probably going to need support, okay? Because we want to make sure that your kid goes to an alternative space, aka the library, and an alternative lesson, also known as not Mattel trans dolls, okay? <laughs> yes? Can we just make the point that Danvers, Karen, Ranieri, um, had ideas that were incorporated into your opt-out form and it was expanded last fall. That's right. To include surveys. That's right. So I keep seeing emails from parents, so it's nice to put a face email. But that's a great point. So Panorama, for example, uh, probably the most well-known company that does the uh, surveys, okay? Uh, you can definitely opt out of those. Many times they're uh, put there for um, social emotional learning. Doesn't that sound great, right? Social emotional learning. But really that's just a target on your kids if they're part of the group think or not, okay? Um, so especially the LGBTQ group thing. So you can definitely opt out of the surveys. Uh, one survey question in Hanover, Massachusetts was, would you ever have sex with a black person? Yes. Now is that racist, right? Of course it is. Uh, but that eventually, uh, a few moms, a lot of moms, actually went to the school committee meeting, raised havoc, and I looked at the nonverbals of the principal, and I don't even think he knew that that was going on. And it was going on in the senior English class, where there were 17-year-old and 18-year-old students 
And the English teacher allegedly says, please lie about your age so you can take the survey. Because you had to be 18 or older wow. for this particular survey. Okay? So know what's going on regarding these surveys. And then they say, oh, we don't let this information go out to the, you know, beyond the school. Well, I don't know if that's the case either. Karen. Comment on that. There was a card that was on a table during lunch that a group called Danvers Cares, which is many of you have heard of that group, and I see a lot of grandparents here. Danvers Cares does a lot of great work. They also went into the school during lunch, and they set up a table in the middle school, and the card was for... I engage in sexual activity with trans women, trans men, non-binary, gender queer. I am asexual, but I don't have sex. Cisgender, I don't know if I can define cisgender at this point. A lot of people can't, a lot of kids definitely can't. This was brought in during lunch for 11 year olds and 12 year olds. This was December of 2021. So this has been in our schools for a long time. So I went to the principal, who is not a principal here anymore, and said, did you see this? Did you read this? And he said, well, no. He said, did you look at what's on the table at lunchtime for 11-year-olds? Well, they've come in here before. So being vigilant has to be the minimum point. Yeah. We need to go maximum. That's right. Because if the principal doesn't know what's on the table for the 11 year old at lunchtime, right. and your kid brings this home, you know, I ha somebody brought this home and posted it. And it's stunning to me. Yeah. So, one other yeah. thing every trans, every trans surgery who goes into medical care is 1.7 million for pharma. Hmm. <laughs> I would also say, I would say, be the Burlington dad. Be the Burlington dad who has a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the assistant superintendent, gets educated, and gets the pride flags gone the next day, right? And gets the calendar taken off, and he's still, he's not stopping there, right? Actually, we're gonna do a Celebrate Life Month in January, where kids are gonna wear Celebrate Life t-shirts. Wow. Uh, in January. This is another tool in the toolbox, right? Make that principal send 20 kids home, right? I mean, to a certain extent, you got to push the issue a little bit, right? And if you want to do stuff like that, come talk to us. Let's work together on this issue, okay? Yeah? I was just made aware of some issues with the, um, the uh, laptops. A laptop specialist came in to talk to the school committee, and I was just listening, and I can't ask any questions or anything, but he was telling them how important it was that it's kept... Um, these surveys, they have no way of tracing them back to the child. And they went on and on and on about that. At the end of the, ex uh, of the uh, lecture, they said to him, well, what happens if one of these students lose a laptop? Oh, we can trace it right back to the student. He said that, but he did, and it's on tape. So when your child is filling out these surveys, they are able to focus on maybe a kid that might be on the verge of thinking about doing this so they know what to get and how to get through these surveys. That's just my take on what's going on and why would they lie so specifically that there's no way they can trace these surveys back to the students. Students have That's to have, true. they have an ID when they log in to Panorama. Right. They're given an ID. I work in school. Okay. So, so they're, they're tracking the kids. Okay. I mean, you know, the data harvesting and all kinds of other things. Yeah, so I would just say parents, I mean, bring that, like, get a private meeting. I mean, this isn't the first time. The, there was a parent in Westminster, Ma or Ashburnham, out in Western Mass, had a private meeting with superintendent, said no political bias in schools, got the pride flags removed. Okay, so I mean this 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 has happened. Stoughton, same thing. Got the pride. Uh, Bill Ricca, they're gonna fly the pro-life flag in Bill Ricca for the half of October uh, because Hal Shirtliff showed up at this at the boards of select meeting with me and we said you're violating their rights, so they're gonna fly the pro-life flag. Okay, so like you have rights, use them, and we can help you do that. Okay, um, yeah. I just wanted to say if you have a child in the Danvers Middle School, um, there's a teacher there, Miss White, an eighth grade teacher, 
and this is more on the race issue. Sure. She told all the students in the class, which went where my grandson was one of them, that they are all a little bit racist, but not her because she's colorblind. So just ask, my grandson tells me everything, but ask your child if, you know, this stuff is going on, if, you know, if things like that are being said to them because they won't tell you, you know what I mean? They think it's no big deal, they blow it off or whatever, yeah. you know, and it, but the, the teachers are doing things like that, you know. Wow. Yeah, so definitely, I mean, be vigilant parents. Any other, we have about 10 minutes. Um, I was told by a student, uh, she's not actually in the Danvers school, but has friends in the Danvers school, that there's things like litter boxes in the right. halls. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that they're allowed to do things like make cat sounds instead of answering questions. Does Emma Pye address any of that or have any hope for anything like that? Because that, that to me sounds like it's really crossing the line. It is crossing the line. Um, have I, do I know any success stories uh, that litter boxes have been removed? Unfortunately not. Are they actually really happening in that school? Yes. Oh, they are? Yeah. 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 Um, so I, I mean, I think to, to a certain extent, this is a lot of the reason why there's a public school exit going on. Parents, parents have had enough. Um, but no, I don't know about, you know. But I would just say, hey, starting off, you know, as your first step, Start an opt-out movement at your school, for sure. Yeah. When are they going to start getting mental health people inside schools with these kids? I don't know, but there's a lot of that going on. Yeah. And if, oh, let me say this. If you guys know students, okay, that are dealing with gender issues and, you know, you disagree and you want a, a different opinion, we also have uh, access to uh, counselors. Okay, that, you know, it's like finding a needle in a haystack to find a counselor these days that will, you know, help a, um, you know, help someone think differently maybe about that. So, let us know, okay? But I know we're getting short on time, so I want to be, I want to be uh, sensitive to that. I just wanted to add it to that, folks, especially all you folks who did this. I didn't know, after listening to this now, it's already here. All these books are already here, and, and I did. There's two parents out here, Karen, one of them. Guy. We went to talk to the superintendent, uh, the new superintendent, about the books, and and we said, why is it all this? You know, where are the classics? So he, we said, well, at least why don't you put some, at least half the classics, half of this stuff, and let's work our way back. But the thing is, I did all these books are already in the school. So if you've got kids in the damn school system, you need to tell them. Hey, can you write down the name of the books you're reading that they're not letting you take home here and, and find out what's going on? Because that's, those things are dangerous. Yeah. yeah. That's a good idea. Let me also mention this, too. There's an organization I didn't know about, but it's called Americans for Fair Treatment. Okay? A lot of times there's teachers that don't want to use the pronouns. You know, teachers get in the middle of this a lot. Okay? Mm -hmm. Um, I can't guarantee that you could win a case or whatever, but there are organizations that are fighting for your rights. So again, if you know teachers that are caught in the middle, uh, let us know, and we can at least refer you to someone that might be able to help you out. So uh, quickly, with the whole opt out yeah. and everything, and, and some of these topics are being brought up in the health class, like I said, there's also talk and in some literature that these type of topics are being brought up in language arts and history. Yeah, There's great question. Yeah. And you can't talk about that. That's that. right. So they're still bringing the book. That's they're right. Still yeah. How do we as parents yeah. fight that? Yeah, yeah. It's a great, it's a great concern. And as a staff, we say the only way we can truly protect our kids from that, I hate to say it, but is to find a school alternative. Because it's so in, invasive. And you don't know, like the English teacher in Hanover that gives the survey and the principal has no idea, you don't know who's an ideal teacher at your school and is going to keep pushing that agenda. So, you know, as a parent, you can only make that decision, but know what's going on in school, have that conversation with your kids. Uh, but ultimately, a lot of people are exiting the public school, as Karen was talking about in Worcester. Yeah. 30% is that right? In high school. Over the last eight years, we've down 30% enrollment. So Danvers has a learning center at Great Rock uh, that is growing. Yes. So just FYI. And if you homeschool, you can still sit and play sports. Did you guys know that? Even though you still find a lot of this nonsense in the sports program, but anyway.
Um, you shared your mission statement of a mass family in the beginning, but you're not limited to just people who are um, favorable to Judeo-Christian right. ethic. You will work with any parent. Hey, I'm about to go no down and speak at a, a mosque. Muslim parent. So, Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to speak at my first mosque coming up. Uh, so, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to mention book looks. Yeah, booklooks.org, great site. Um, if you text the word books to 87891, this is the, um, this is the, uh, what's it called? Uh, it's a summary of all the crazy books out there, okay? So you don't have to go do the research. Uh, it actually even gives you the number of expletives in the book uh, and pictures and everything, okay? So text books to 87891. And if you're concerned about any book, you can look it up on booklooks.org. Yes. Mr. Ford, who teaches ninth grade in my high school, has a giant pride flag and two little pride flags sitting at his doorway and his desk. Yeah. So this would get, I think, and I'm not an attorney, I'm not an attorney, but no political bias. Okay. So I get back to controversial issue policy, no political bias policy. Okay. So you got to see if that policy has been adopted in your school district and then use that policy as you know, a reason to say, hey, if you're going to have that flag, you know, just like the city of Boston had to allow Hal Shirley to have the Christian flag after flying 284 mm -hmm. flags and yeah. not saying no to anybody, right? right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Just like the pro-life flag got, gets, gets to fly in Bill Ricca for half a month, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's start using the policies that are already in place and be a great civics lesson for your class to, uh, you know, along the way. So the collective bargaining agreement sometimes has language in it too that would prohibit teachers from doing that. So it's another angle to look okay. at, other than just the you know the handbook at the school. Okay. And I was going to say, you know, there are a lot of principals, a lot of principals and teachers, and superintendents who are just they're not awake to this. Yep. And it's I don't know what's worse, doing it intentionally, knowing the right. harm that you're doing, or just being blissfully unaware. Yep. You know, I don't know which is worse, but I think. The more the parents are having these conversations, and yep. it doesn't have to be, because I think a lot of people are not comfortable saying this in a, in a room full of people who are constantly virtually signaling, right? right. They're the one that's speaking up. So to have those one-on-one -on -one yep. conversations with admin in a calm and reasonable way that's right. goes a long way to waking some of these people well, up. Well, to your point, the assistant yeah. superintendent in Burlington had to be looking on Wikipedia while the father was giving her the answers on Trans Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. Joe, did you have anything you wanted to say or have anything filled out? Uh, I just wanted to make sure that people, if they are willing and interested, that they sign this because we, we can send out information in the future. Okay. To, if you put your email address, you don't have to put your phone number on there. Okay. Uh, but I've just been thinking this week that um, my hope for this meeting tonight would that we have parents get to know each other and realize that they're in this together. And I think going forward, that if the parents of students could talk to each other and do before dads in whatever town it was. Lemister. Um, Lemister, thank you. Um, that would be great. Yeah, that would be my vision for tonight is come together. You know, you're in it together, work together. And it doesn't take that many people That's right. who are aligned. That's right to be effective. And we um, retirees can help support you know, Absolutely. information and all that too. We need grandmas and grandpas, <laughs> yeah. that's for sure. Also, uh, I'm here, I'm Mark Zuberich, and I'm here to film this. And this will be shown on cable, channel 36 for Verizon, and I think channel six for Comcast, uh, probably next week. Okay. So you, if you can look at it. You guys, use MFI as a hub, right, for, your, for information. So take advantage of the keywords. I imagine most of you probably texted a keyword to 87891. Okay, when you do that, then you'll get texts from us, okay, from 87891. Get in touch with us. Leave your information if you want my cell phone, okay? But let's this let's almost use this too as kind of a beginning of a discussion because we're not all going to have all the answers tonight, and you're going to have nuanced situations come up, right? So let's stay in touch with us. Let's, as Joe said, let's continue to have the conversation, okay? Uh, any final comments or questions? What was that number again? No. <laughs> <laughs> Nine seven eight. <laughs> no eight.
Oh, I thought you were asking my cell phone. <laughs> uh, it's, it's unfortunate that we can't get 